Hi, Crosswalk. I'd like to welcome you back for another worship service here online. It is so great to have you uh, here for online worship. And one of the things we've been talking about as a staff is something we are starting to call the digital campus. And what we mean by that is, is that as you're watching from home, that, that it's not just a watching thing of watching worship, but rather we think of where you're at right now as being where church is. And so there are so many things that you can be involved in. One tool that I strongly encourage you to, to take advantage of is something called Church Center. And this Church Center, maybe you've heard of this before, maybe you already have it if you've been a crosswalk before, but the Church Center app is so important and, and such a useful tool for us because it keeps so many things together. I have it right here on my phone, and it is something that from now on, we're going to have everyone who comes to worship open every week. And the reason why is because there's a communication card. Uh, there is an opportunity to join groups uh, through this app. There's also a way to register for events, including uh, the, the, the in-person services when you are ready for that. If we're still doing registrations, this is where you're going to find them. Other events like the blood drive that is coming up and also the opportunities for St. Mary's Food Bank. All of these are going to be found on the Church Center app. So it's my encouragement for you to, to do that today. One final thing you can do on that as well is the uh, an offering. And at this time, just want to take a moment to thank everyone. Uh, we have been able to to do fairly well financially. I mean, we haven't had to lay off staff or anything like that. We have been behind a little bit from where we've been in the past, but all things considered, uh, we, are, we are very thankful for everything that the Lord has given us. And so, again, the encouragement one last time as you, you, you think of the online worship is to be more and more involved and engage in the work of Crosswalk. And the Church Center app is one way or one app and, and one thing that can help you do it. Now, wherever you're at, I ask you to stand up and join us as we begin worship.
Each week we have a great opportunity to come before the Lord and one of the great gifts that he gives us is the privilege of coming to him in repentance and receiving the forgiveness that he offers through Jesus Christ. Today as we go through the message there is one verse that really stuck out to me and that is how can I do this wicked thing and sin against God? And it's what Joseph is saying. He's being tempted at that moment by a sexual sin by Potiphar's wife and and being told, come on, come on and do this. Give in to this and, and come and commit this sin with me. And Joseph was able to make the connection between the the wrong thing, the sinful act that he did, and the God who, who it was a, a, a breaking of trust and a breaking of relationship that, that Joseph saw clearly, if I cheat on with you, Potiphar's wife, I'm cheating on God. And the reality of it is, is every time we sin, we do a great wickedness and we sin against God. And for that reason, he, again, he gives us this privilege of coming to him. He calls us to repentance for what we've done. And let's bow our heads and pray in repentance now. Dear Lord God, we, we come to you and th- those words, uh, how can I do this great wickedness and, and sin against God have been on my heart this week. And I've just found myself in, in so many different situations uh, confronting myself and realizing, oh my goodness, the sin that you've gotten so much com- so comfortable with, uh, you're doing it and breaking this relationship with God. And so help us, Lord, as we go back to see the, the thoughts, the words, the actions, the, the lack of love that we've shown to you and to others. Help us to see it for what it is. And, and we confess that today. Lord, we have done wickedness. We, we've sinned against you and we deserve the punishment of hell because of it. But Lord, we come to you asking and begging for your mercy. Uh, Lord, we know that, that you want us to come to you. We know that you love us. And so we come to you on our knees and simply say, Lord, have mercy on us because we are sinners. Now, as we come and we confess that sin, it's this reality that Christ also came to deal with that wickedness, to deal with that sin. And when he went to the cross, he took that wickedness, that wickedness that was directed at God, that he took on himself, and that punishment that God would direct towards us, he endured on the cross. And it was there that each one of our acts of wickedness, our acts of sin, was taken and paid for in full by Jesus Christ. And for that reason, I assure you, through the promises of Jesus Christ, that your sins are forgiven. Uh, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed them from you and and God remembers them no more. Uh, You are justified. It's just as if you have never sinned. And now in, in joy and peace for what Christ has done for us, let's praise the Lord.
everyone, and welcome to our message series, Jump. We are in the second installment, and our theme today is Building Trust. Now, to catch you up, if you didn't get a chance to see last week's message, I strongly encourage you to go watch it, and it is about being mindful of our past. Now, the message series is, is built on something, the concepts of something called TBRI, which is Trust-Based Relationship Intervention. And just, just a reminder from last week that the TBRI, uh, it, they found this research when they were working with children who came from traumatic backgrounds. And what they realized is these kids who had experienced trauma as they grew up, even when they got into structured and, and healthy surroundings, had difficult connecting and developing relationships. And as we looked at the message last week, we were mindful of our own past, that we encouraged everyone to take a look back at maybe the pain and hurt of the past. And all of, the, all of us have them, whether we caused the pain or whether we experienced the pain, or most of us, probably some of both, that we realize that that past pain can and does affect present relationships. But we also saw that part of our past is also our relationship with God and specifically our relationship with Jesus. And so the most beautiful part of our past is that relationship with Jesus, the forgiveness that he offers, the, the love that he gives us, the fact that he is with us through all of our adversity. And now today, as we get into this message, uh, building trust, we are going to see how Really, if we are going to build trust, that we need to have trust in him first and how having trust in him as our God is going to free us up to, to build trust and have healthy relationships with each other. We are going to start with actually the same verse we started with last week from John 3 verse 16. This is a reminder of the trust relationship we have with God. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Wow. When you think about that, the, that all the relationships in our lives that are going to be lasting and are going to be healthy are going to be built on trust, and our relationship with God is no exception. He could have a relationship with us based on fear. He could have a relationship with us based on demands and, and our effort and our actions, but he doesn't. That's not how he wants to have a relationship with us. Rather, it's through trust. And that trust starts in a person, in Jesus Christ. And it starts while we watch him and, and we watch the way he lived in this world perfectly, true God, true man, in our place. And we see the relationship he had with the Father, that trust relationship inside the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect trust with one another. And now, as we look at that, we also can have trust in Jesus as we look at the fact that he went to the cross for us, that he rose from the dead on Easter as proof that, that he has paid the price and God has accepted it for our sins. And now we can live in this faith and trust relationship with him not only for our, our spiritual life, which we can do, but also as we live throughout our earthly life, knowing that God is with us. And so the first fill-in you can write in, first fill-ins are these. My relationship with God is built on trust. My relationship with God is built on trust. Jesus shows me that God is worthy of my trust. So again, that trust relationship and God is worthy of it. Now, before we get into the lesson, just one other point that I wanted to make about why having a relationship with God, a trust-based relationship with God, is so important for trust-based relationships with other people is, maybe I'll say it this way, it's important for me in my marriage for me to have a healthy relationship with God because then when I look at my wife, I don't need her to be God for me. And what I mean by that is because I have a ha healthy relationship with God that I know he's my savior, that I know he loves me perfectly, that, that I know he is God and I am not, that when I look at my wife, I don't need her to be my savior. I don't need her to be the, the savior of my emotions. I don't need her to be the savior of, of my identity or, or the different crises I go through in my life. But rather, she can be my wife. 
She can be someone who is there for me. I commit my love to her. She commits her love to me, but, but we're not doing that perfectly. That she does not take the place of God in my life. And in the same way that she looks at me, I thank God for her healthy relationship, her trust-based relationship with him because she doesn't need me to be God. She doesn't expect me 24-7 to do the things that only God can do. She doesn't expect me to fill the God-sized hole in her heart that is reserved for only God. And what it does is it, it helps us to have proper expectations of each other uh, that we don't expect perfection, but our relationships are, are not only trust-based, but they're grace-filled. And so th think about that a little bit. As we, we go into this lesson, what you're going to see is Joseph running into situations that are less than perfect. And he's okay with it. And the reason why he's okay with less than perfect situations in his friendships or his relationships is because he still has God and that trust-based relationship with him. And it, and it doesn't mean it's not going to hurt, but it also means that everything's not going to come crashing down either. We go to Genesis. And the last, where we left off last time was Joseph had just been sold into slavery by his brothers and was now being taken to Egypt. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted his care, entrusted in his care everything he owned. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. There's a trust-based relationship. And, and when you see that trust-based relationship, the elements that are here, I, I think are very important to see. And, and first of all, the elements that, that as we, we look at Joseph going down, remember, he's sold into slavery. He's, he's in just a very difficult time. You could see that, that maybe he just wanted to, to fold up and, in a ball and just be done with life. But that's not what he did. And the reason why is because he did have this trust-based relationship at that same time in God. And we're told that, that God blessed him. And so what Joseph did then is as he had this relationship with God and the, the values that, that God had as well, like things like hard work and being faithful and earning the respect and trust of other people, that's what Joseph did. And it was recognized by Potiphar. First of all, it was recognized by him. Then it was embraced by him. Then it was rewarded by him. And so in the blank, you can write, the Lord is steady in turbulent times. So the first fill in there is, the Lord is steady in turbulent times. When God steadies me, I can be steady as well. And in the second part of that fill in, I almost put, I can be steady for others. And the reason why is because as we look at that, that is what happened. That as Joseph was in a turbulent time in his life, he rested on God and his promises. And as he was steadied by God and kept steady in the middle of this turbulence, in the middle of the storm, Potiphar recognized that. He recognized the blessing from God. And then he used, he recognized that he used Joseph to steady himself and used him to, to take care of everything in his home. But that's not the point. That's not the point necessarily for right now. The point for us right now is to recognize it that God is the one who turbulent times steadies us. And that term steady is one that I used on purpose. And the reason why I used it is because it's a nautical term. Uh, maybe you know the phrase, steady as she goes. And that is, is meant for a ship that, that they will yell to say, keep going in this direction. Even though we're getting buffeted around, keep it going steady, keep it going straight, keep it going in the right direction. 
Now, this makes me think especially of, of my, one of my favorite TV shows, which is Deadliest Catch. And what's weird about Deadliest Catch is that I, I really enjoy the TV show, but everything about it that's on the show I don't like. I don't like cold. I don't like water. I don't like being on ships. I don't like the 30-foot waves or anything like that. But I am enthralled as I watch it, especially when it are, there are heavy seas, because they go steady as she goes. And what they do very often is, is that when these waves come, they recognize that they have to go straight into them. That if they get hit by a side, they are in serious trouble. And so what they do is they go steady as she goes, stay on course, stay on the direction, and you are going to be fine. For Christians, it's also steady as she goes. And I think that's a reason why so many people like the verse from Jeremiah, that I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Because what that is telling us is that we're on a course and God is saying steady as she goes. And for Joseph, there's also a course. He was taking him and he needed to go to Egypt, but he needed to go through Potiphar's house. There was a place where God was taking him, but this was not necessarily it. But even in the middle of it, even in the middle of the turbulence, steady as she goes. We go on from there. So what happened now that he's in this great situation? Now Joseph was well-built and handsome, so he, he had a lot of things going for him. And after a while, though, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me, but he refused. With me in charge, he said, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Wow. So, so we see this now. All these things are, are going. And once again, in the middle of a trust-based relationship, Joseph is modeling this perfectly. And, and what is happening is, is there is a pressure, a pressure from Potiphar's wife to change Joseph's values. And I'm going to tell you, as you go through life, the same is going to happen. You have values that you live by, morals that God gives us values. At Crosswalk, we have values. And as we have these values, there's always going to be a temptation when pressure comes to leave those values. But that's not what Joseph did. Instead, with this trust-based relationship, do you see what he did? When she came and made this proposition for Joseph and say, Joseph, this would be good for you and this would be good for me. Who does he talk about first? Potiphar, my master. How, how could I do this to my master? He trusts me with everything. This individual, I, I have a trust-based relationship with him. And so this trust-based relationship makes me considerate about how this is going to affect him as well. And then the ultimate trust-based relationship. How can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Wow. For, for Joseph to be able to see that this conduct was not just about a relationship with another woman, but this was about a relationship with God. And I'm telling you, it is my prayer that you would see your life through that filter. As you look at the, the temptations that you run up against, that when I run up against temptations in my life as well, do I see them? Do I recognize them for what they are? They are temptations to sin against God. That, that if Joseph would have done this, he, he would not only have destroyed his relationship with Potiphar, he would not have only destroyed the relationship with Potiphar's wife, but it would have destroyed the relationship with God. Joseph was going steady as she goes and he wasn't going to let Potiphar's wife change that. And so in the middle of these trust-based relationships, this is what we need to remember. There will always be individuals not to trust. That when we talk about this jump, finding joy and peace in trust-based relationships, there are people that you need to never jump to, never trust, never go to. And then the next fill-in, not to trust. With these individuals, we draw clear boundaries. 
and we let them know, you know what, Th- this is a, a friendship, this is a relationship, whatever it is, this is conduct, Where, wherever that boundary might be to say, I am not going to go there. And you see how Joseph did that, especially at the end when it said he refused to go to bed with her, which was a clear boundary. But then he drew a boundary even farther away from that, that he didn't even want to be near her that he didn't want to give her the wrong impression. He, he didn't want to in any way give any indication that he was interested in this. As we consider this with trust-based relationships, I want you to think about yourself for a moment. You know, we, we can look and we can do an analyzation of, of Potiphar's wife and, and the fact that she didn't have a, a trust-based relationship with God, that she was looking for something in Joseph that she should have been getting from her husband. There, trust me, there are a lot of things trust-based relationship-wise that are messed up with Potiphar's wife. But as we look at this from the side of Joseph, the thing that, that we need to learn more than anything else is, is that word consideration or being considerate. That we need to take time and consider how our actions affect others around us. And especially those who are close to us. Because my guess is that there have been times in your life where you have not been considerate or trustworthy. And it's for these times where we say, Lord, forgive us for the wickedness that we have committed against you. We turn the page and we go on. What happens next? One day he went to the house to attend to his duties and none of the servant, household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and he had run out of the house, she called her household servant. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been bought here to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Oh my goodness. Once again, this is going to take us back on the journey of times when we've had trust-based relationships, when, when we've acted in a trustworthy way, and we've been burned. There have been people in your past, I guarantee it, who have lied to you. There have been individuals who have cheated you. There have been individuals who have hurt you in some way. And as we look at this, this is probably about as clear a case as you can see where someone truly was a victim uh, in every sense of the word. Joseph did nothing to bring it in on himself. And so my encouragement is be careful of the lie. Don't believe this lie. That's the next villain. Don't believe the lie. I am better off alone. I'm better off alone. I've been burned one too many times. I, I'm just going to, to stay alone, be isolated, be by myself. I'm going to give up, give up on all the different things. And, and I've been there with people before who have said that. You know what? I'm giving up on relationships. I'm, I'm never going to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend again. I'm never going to trust them again. That as they look at the pain that they've had in a marriage to say, I, I, I cannot or I will not go through that again. Or even in friendships, you can see that. Or maybe even in relationships inside a church, maybe inside of a group uh, or, or something like that. that. Because people are sinful, this is going to happen. We've already talked about our own shortcomings. The, the times when we have not considered how it affects others. And there are times when others will act the same way towards us. And I know it hurts. And, and as we learned last week, we need to be mindful of it. But that doesn't mean that relationships don't work. And so we need to get to the next verses. Genesis 39, starting the second part of verse 20. But while Joseph was there in prison... The Lord was with him. He showed him his kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison and he was responsible for all that was done there. 
the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Steady as she goes, Joseph. That, that was the Lord's me message, steady as she goes. And so as they were going and as the, the turbulence continued around them, you would think that maybe they came to a calm in the storm where, where this wouldn't affect them anymore. It was still steady as she goes. The Lord had a place where he was going to take Joseph. And in the midst of that, Joseph was steadied by God and his promises. And he recognized just because he had been, been thrown out of Potiphar's house, it didn't mean that God couldn't bless him. He wasn't relying on Potiphar for blessing. He was relying on God for that. And even when he was in jail, he found it. And as you look back at past relationships and, and different things that have happened, uh, man, I'm just going to tell you that there are, are relationships that I have from my past that make my heart ache. That, that there are things and relationships that I had in my past with individuals who are now not part of my life. And it, and it, and it wasn't like a bad ending necessarily. It, it wasn't that. that. That when you're a pastor... Uh, and you're a pastor of a church. Uh, Jeff talks about this a lot. He says that, that in a church, remember that a church is not a lake. A church is a river. And that means that there are people who, who move through it. And when I think about that, as a pastor, there have been people uh, who have left a, a church that I'm a pastor at, maybe moved out of the area. And it hurts me because I miss their friendship. I, I miss having them in my group. I, I miss being able to see them on, on a weekly basis. And, and for that reason, I just look back at some of it. I'm, I'm thankful for the relationship, but at the same time, I'm, I'm a little just feeling nicked up because of it. And there was a, a lady I was talking to once in counseling that, that I was kind of sharing this with, that, that she was talking to me about how I was doing and and one of the things she shared with me is this fill-in. God puts people in our lives for a reason, for a season, and precious few for a lifetime. And I want you to think about that in relationships because that is so important. Every relationship you, you have is not going to be for a lifetime. And as we remember that, we, we need to, first of all, look at this and, and look at the, the reason. That there are times when we are going to be in a person's life for a reason. And th one time I remember that specifically, a time I was there for a reason, is when I was driving down the interstate and I happened to see a car off on the side of the road that had a flat tire. And as I was driving up, I see, saw two ladies looking at it. And I said, you know what, I am, I'm going to pull over. So I pulled over and I changed their tire for them, and I never saw them again in my life. And those ladies thanked me so much, but, but the reality of it was, is I was in their life for a reason. That God intersected me with them for that moment, and that reason for changing their tire, I took care of it, and, and then maybe I'll see them again in heaven, but until then, I doubt if I ever will. And that's okay. The next one is that there are people who are in our lives for a season. And for me, understanding this, the best way for me to understand it is understanding the role of a first and second and third grade teacher. That, that a good first grade teacher who does their job is going to be there for a season. That their, their children are going to come into their room uh, just getting out of kindergarten and when they leave at the end of that school year, they're going to be ready for second grade. And if a teacher tried to keep that child in the first grade for years and years and years and said, I want to just keep having a relationship with you, they would be stunting their growth. And in the same way, as we look at our relationships, there are people that we are there for a season that maybe we are helping them through a time in their life and they're going to move on uh, where they don't necessarily need our help anymore. And there will also be people that, that serve us in the same way, that take us through a season in life, that help us. And we'll have great memories and, and those relationships will have served us. But then we move on. And then finally, there will be some that are there for a lifetime. And 
about this time in my life, I, I'm beginning to understand maybe more and more what relationships are those relationships. But you, you begin to see that people who have been there for your entire life. At this point, I, I look at that, my brothers and sisters, my, my parents are like that. As I, I think about my relationship with my wife, of her being there with me, we've now lived together longer than, than we were ever single before this. And so in the relationships, I guess the point of, of saying this is to understand that just because a relationship doesn't last forever doesn't mean that it hasn't accomplished the purpose that God had in mind. And specifically here, if you're going to apply that truth to, to Joseph, God used Potiphar to get Joseph through a season in his life. I'm sure he learned a ton about administration. Uh, he was around the court he, uh, of Pharaoh, so, so he got to know some of the workings that were going on. He, he definitely used that time. But God had other plans for Joseph that we're going to see a little bit down the road. And for that reason, he needed to move on. So as you look back and, and maybe look back at some different seasons of your life and, and begin to lament and wonder whether those relationships uh, th that you wanted to give up on them, that maybe they accomplished the reason or the season that God had in mind. The very last part of that verse is where it said, the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Another reminder that the way God was blessing Joseph changed, but the fact that he was blessing him didn't. And that takes us to the final verse. And this, we're going to leave Joseph right now in prison and the Lord blessing him there. But where we're going to go is, is just the final discussion about relationships. And this is when Jesus says, this is what Jesus has to say about relationships and our relationship with him. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. As we look at this, it's a great picture of a vine and a branch because we know that, right? That, that with a branch, if there, there's a branch of some kind, that if we break it off, uh, even if we break cut off flowers and we put them in a vase and even put them in water, that after a period of time, they are going to die. That if they are going to continue to flourish, they need to be connected. The, the, the vine, the branches need to be connected. And as we look at that, as we're talking about building trust and trust-based relationships and finding peace and joy in these relationships, we need to understand that there is this connection that we have with God. And then there's also this relationship that we have with other people. And so a, a term that, that I had never heard before, but as I was doing prep for this sermon uh, that I found is, is something called relational nutrients. And I found this fascinating. It says that, that relational nutrients, it, it's trying to, to look at ourselves as if we were plants and as if we had roots where we took in nutrients. There's something called internalization. And internalization, humans take in or internalize things from other humans that oftentimes become part of our own character. We are always taking in something from those around us, whether healthy, like grace, support, and wisdom, or toxic, like judgment, shame, or control. But the thing about it, the thing about that I found in incredible about this relational nutrients is they said, do not think of it like filling up gas in a car. Because it's not like you fill it up, then you go use it, then you fill it up again. But rather, you need to understand that these relational nutrients, that, that what we get from other people and what we, what we make part of us be, does become part of us. It becomes part of who we are. Now, the first way that, that you need to see this in a relationship is in our relationship with God. And in our relationship with God, the way that you are going to find this internalization is through Bible passages. 
And it's my prayer that you already have that to one extent or another. The, the passage that I started with, right? That John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is internalized in my psyche. I mean that this, is, this has been part, John three sixteen has been part of who I am for a very, very, very long time. And it comes from my relationship with God. But I am telling you that in my life as a Christian and also in my ministry as a pastor, there are places that I go in God's word that, that are just, they, they become part of a fiber of, of who I am. I think of Titus, but when the kindness and love of Jesus our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. And, and you can call it memory work because I do have them memorized. But the reality of it is they're not just memory work. They're just not passages that are in my head, but they are passages that are in my heart. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. These are places I go back and I visit. And, I'm, I, and I tell you, when I do a Bible reading and I read through the Bible, for instance, like in a year, that I get to those passages and on my version Bible app, it's highlighted and I see them and, it, and it's just like a warm blanket, an old blanket that you, you put over yourself and you're like, man, these words are so comforting to me. And they become a part of who I am, not just by knowing them, but I pray by doing them as well. But now here's, here's the cool part. And that is, this also happens with people. I am going to bet that at some time in your life that you can look back at a conversation that you had with an individual where they said something to you, they saw something in you or they gave you an encouragement that has been with you now for many years. It just becomes part of who you are. I, I can think of that in so many different ways, whether it was times a, a professor shared something with me, for instance, in, in the classroom, that I go back to it, oh my goodness, that's, that's already, it's almost 27, 28 years ago, and I remember these like they were yesterday, because they are relational nutrients. And, and one of those I think of, it, uh, him tell, one of my teachers telling me, Dan, the secret of ministry is to never let anyone else's sin bother you more than your own. Oh my gosh. I have thought of that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times throughout my ministry, especially at times when I get frustrated with other people. Relational nutrients. I also think of friendships I have. Friendships I have with, with just great Christian friends. Uh, again, not needing to take the place of God but what we do is, is we do everything from go on hikes together to meet at growth group together to simply go out and, and have a conversation. And they give me relational nutrients. They build me up. Oh my goodness. I, I could sit here and literally talk for hours about conversations that I've had with individuals at church that have built me up on, on a given day but then stuck with me and I, I, that at times as I go back and I, I think through situations, I remember those words of wisdom. I'm telling you, that is what I want for you. And that is what God wants for you as well. If we are going to have trust-based relationships and we are going to not only receive what God wants us to have with him in this trust-based relationship, but also experience that with others, we need to spend time together. The Bible talks about this in, in Psalm 1 where it, where it talks about our relationship with God. We need to be like a tree planted by streams of water that, that always has a place to put its roots, that, that we need to plant ourselves next to God. But I am telling you, you need to plant yourself next to other Christians as well. And right now, I, I, I know I mentioned the Church Center app at the beginning of the service or also our, our webpage. You real, I'm begging you. I am begging you to consider a group this year, especially if you have never done it before. And I don't care if it's a Christian essentials class to just get started, those one-day classes, 
or a Bible basics one where you go a little bit deeper with one of our pastors um, over a, a 12 week period. But I am begging you to get these nutrients that to, to begin this building of trust is done only when we spend time with other Christians. The final blank you can put in there is, in relationships, God gives us relational nutrients. He gives us what we need day by day. He gives us nurturing connection, nurturing connection to him and other people. I hope you continue to stay with us throughout this series. Again, it's one that I love and it, I, hope, I hope you can tell how excited I am about it because of what it has to offer everyone who hears it. And now as we consider this message, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you keep us steady in the storm. And the, the, the reason why, Lord, is you keep us focused. You, you keep us heading in the direction, heading in your direction, the path that you have laid out for us. And Lord, as we do that, we're going to hit some waves. And some of those waves are going to come over the deck and they're going to, you know, make us feel unsteady. But the reality, Lord, is you are with us. You are steady. You keep us steady in the storm. Now, Lord, as we think about relationships, help, help us to be considerate and trustworthy. And, and as we do that, Lord, more and more, and as we, uh, people can see that in us, the reality of it is, is they're going to want to spend time with us as well. And so, Lord, help us as we, we go through our lives to, to, to keep our eyes open for individuals that we can have healthy relationships with uh, that are based on our relationship with you. My prayer is that everyone who is hearing this today considers a group to be part of or at least a friendship and a relationship that they can develop and grow closer to get what you have to offer, these relational nutrients that you give us with other Christians. Lord, thank you for the relationship we have with Christ that, that is a strong relationship to base all of these other relationships on. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And as you go from here today, uh, my encouragement is to remember the next step. And that is, I will focus on the words and promises and actions by which God proves he is trustworthy. So see God steady in the storm in your life. And then the last part, which we just talked about, I will seek out and foster healthy relationships and friendships uh, in, in whether it be in friendships or in my group life. And now as you go from here today, go with the Lord's blessing. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord, look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Have a great day. Yeah.